welcome to my channel I'm Scott and in this video I'm gonna walk you through the process of valuing VMware stock so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell VMware is a cloud computing and virtualization technology company last year Broadcom said it would acquire VMware for 61 billion dollars in cash and stock in addition to assuming eight billion dollars of VMware's net debt that transaction is expected to close this year the company is headquartered in Palo Alto, California and was founded in 1998. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 57 billion market cap. They're trading at 132 a share and they have 429 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Their free cash flow in 21, 22, and 23 is around $4 billion. They completed their fiscal 2023. And just recently, they completed their first quarter for fiscal year 2024. If that sounds odd to you, leave a comment and I can explain further. They had the highest free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, $4.6 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was over $2 billion in 2021. It declines each year down to $1.3 billion in the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that grows each year from $11.8 billion up to $13.5 billion. Let's go through their first quarter press release page by page. Revenue in the first quarter of 2024 of $3.3 billion. That's up 6% from the first quarter of 2023. Subscription and SaaS revenue, SaaS is software as a service. That was 1.2 billion, up 35%. And subscription and SaaS revenue was 37% of their total revenue. So 1.2 billion over 3.3 billion is 37%. Their subscription and SaaS annual recurring revenue for the first quarter was 4.8 billion, up 32%. That just means they took their first quarter revenue, $1.2 billion, and multiplied it by four. They annualized it. Gap net income for the first quarter was $224 million, or $0.52 cents a share, down 9% from last year. Last year was $242 million, $0.57 cents a share. Non-gap net income, $644 million, or $1.49 a share. That's up 16%. Last year was $542 million, or $1.28 a share. Non-GAAP income is when a company strips out expenses like stock-based compensation. GAAP operating income for the first quarter was $309 million, down 24%. Non-GAAP of $819 million, up 6%. Operating cash flow for the first quarter is $1.75 billion. Free cash flow, $1.65 billion. RPO, remaining performance obligation for the first quarter was $13 billion, up 13% year over year. The way to calculate RPO, it's a sum of deferred revenue plus the sum of the backlog revenue. Revenue remaining on a project they have not billed for. We are pleased with Q1 results. The past quarter we demonstrated momentum and engagement with our customers and partners as we continue to help them transform their businesses and unlock the full potential of multi-cloud. We are excited to introduce new product innovations and host our customers and partners this year at VMware Explore events across Las Vegas, Singapore, Brazil, Barcelona, and Japan. Our Q1 performance reflected a good start to fiscal 2024 and was highlighted by our subscription and SaaS revenue, which grew 35% year over year. We continue to invest in our cloud offerings to drive future recurring revenue growth. Last month, Karen Dykstra took over as CFO. Here's their second page. At Mobile World Congress 2023, VMware announced innovations, enhancements, and partnerships to further meet the evolving needs of communication service providers and enterprises, including VMware Telco Cloud Platform, Project Kauai, Vodafone Qatar, Samsung and VMware, NTT Data and VMware. They announced VMware Cloud Managed Services. They unveiled the next evolution of the VMware Partner Connect program. They released new VMware Anywhere workspace platform enhancements. VMware ARIA automation was ranked as a leader in the Forrester wave. They received recognition for their ESG leadership. VMware is a leading provider of multi-cloud services for all apps, enabling digital innovation with enterprise control. 
As a trusted foundation to accelerate innovation, VMware software gives businesses the flexibility and choice they need to build the future. Revenue for the three months ending May 5th, 2023 is $3.3 billion, up from $3.1 billion from the same time last year. $500 million of their revenue is from licensing, subscriptions in SaaS $1.2 billion, services $1.5 billion. Their license revenue went down from $570 million to $517 million. It was 18.5% of their revenue, now it's 16%. Subscription and SaaS went up from $900 million to $1.2 billion, from 29% of their revenue to 37%. That's the best revenue. It's high margins and expands their business. Under services, they list software maintenance. That went down from $1.3 billion to $1.2 billion. It was 42% of their revenue. Now it's 38%. Professional services is pretty flat, and that also went down as a percent of revenue from 10% to 9.5%. Half their revenue is services, the other half is licensing and subscriptions. Their US revenue only went up a little, but their international revenue went up a lot more, from 1.57 billion to 1.7 billion. Last year, 49% of their revenue came from the US, now it's 47%. In order to generate the 3.3 billion of revenue, they had a bunch of expenses. 39 million from licensing, subscription services 208 million, they have to maintain their platform, also customer service. Cost of service is $400 million. R&D, 850 million. They're always looking to improve their current products and come up with new ones. That falls under R&D. And their biggest expense is marketing, $1.1 billion. General and administrative expenses, $370 million. So their operating income is lower. It was $400 million, now it's $300 million. So their margins are getting squeezed. They received 64 million of interest on their investments. They paid 80 million of interest on their debt. Last year they spent 71 million. They had a gain of 6 million from other. Last year they had a loss of 10 million. So their income before taxes is 300 million, 75 million of taxes, net income of 224 million. Since they have 428 million shares outstanding, that gives them an EPS of 52 cents. 224 million over 428 million is 52 cents. Last year they had less shares outstanding, so they added about 7.5 million shares. Let's take a look at their balance sheet. The balance sheet has three sections assets, what the company owns, liabilities, what the company owes, and equity, what the company is worth. The US uses GAAP. Assets are listed most liquid to least liquid. And we start with current assets. Assets that are able to be liquidated into cash within 12 months. So cash is the most liquid asset, 6.5 billion. Last year they had 5.1 billion. Accounts receivable is how much money other companies owe them for selling on credit. 1.8 billion last year was 2.5 billion. So total current assets, 9.6 billion. Last year was 10.2 billion. Current liabilities, 11.7 billion. So let's look at that current ratio. Current ratio is current assets, 9.6 billion, divided by 11,673. Their current ratio is 0.82. Ideally, you'd want to see a current ratio above one. If they had negative free cash flow, that would be a concern, but they do have positive free cash flow, so I wouldn't be too concerned with this. Let's see what it was last year. 10,231, that's their current assets. Current liability is 12,391. It was a little better last year, 0.83. So last year they can cover 83% of their current liabilities with their current assets. This year they can only cover 82% of their current liabilities with their current assets. This could be a timing thing. I would look at any ratio over a long period of time, over several quarters. Property and equipment, 1.6 billion. If they own any real estate or machinery, that falls in the property and equipment. This gets depreciated onto the income statement. Deferred tax assets, $6.2 billion. DTA will improve their taxes in the future. They'll pay less taxes. Intangible assets, $400 million. This could be copyrights or trademarks. Goodwill, $9.6 billion. Goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. Total assets, $30.6 billion. Last year was $31 billion. Let's look at their liabilities. Accounts payable, $225 million. So they bought items on credit, and this is how much they owe other companies. Accrued expenses are $2.1 billion. 
An accrued expense is when a company has incurred an expense but has not paid it yet. It will pay it in the future. Customer deposits. So when customers prepay for an item, it's carried on the balance sheet as a liability. When they deliver the product to the customer or the customer uses that service, then they'll take it off the balance sheet and book it as revenue onto the income statement. The current portion of long-term debt. This is debt they may have took out five, six years ago, but it's due now. One billion is due within the next 12 months. Unearned revenue. This is when a customer makes an advance payment for a product or service they're going to receive in the future. It's similar to customer deposits. Total current liability is 11.7 billion. That's how much money they owe within the next 12 months. They have nine and a half billion of long-term debt, 5.4 billion of long-term unearned revenue. So total liability is 29 billion. Last year was 30 billion. Let's look at the equity section. Additional paid in capital of 1.2 billion. That's how much money they raise from issuing equity. Retained earnings of 660 million. That's a sum of all their prior net incomes. So total equity 1.9 billion. So liabilities plus equity is 30.6 billion, which matches assets right here, 30.6 billion. The balance sheet always has to balance. Let's look at their statement of cash flows. It's broken out into three sections, operating, investing, and financing. Even though they had an accounting profit of 220 million, they actually generated 1.8 billion of cash flow because we have to add back the non-cash items on the income statement depreciation and amortization, stock-based compensation. And then we have to adjust for changes in working capital. They had a cash inflow of 1.4 billion that is due from related parties and some other items. The investing section lists if they buy a building, buy machinery, acquire another company. So they added 100 million of property, plant, and equipment. It looks like they had a small cash outflow of 8 million from a business combination. They probably acquired a smaller company. The financing section shows us equity and debt. It also talks about dividends. So they received $2 million from issuing stock. Last year, they received $119 million. They paid $190 million of stock from their employees. In their financing section, they had a cash outflow of $189 million. Let's look at their capital structure. $2 billion of equity, $11 billion of debt. They have 14% equity, 86% debt. Their net debt is $4.7 billion. So that means they have about six and a half billion of cash on that balance sheet. I gave them a whack of 9.3% and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 82 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $73 billion. We divide that by 429 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 170. They're trading at 132, so they're trading at a 23% discount. It's a pretty strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is close to me. They're at 182. They say the stock is 26% undervalued. Four analysts price this stock, and the average price target is 143. The low is 134. The high is 161. Another eight analysts price this stock and the average price target is 140. They say the stock is 6% undervalued. This is where the stock has been trading since they IPO'd. It looks like right off the bat after a few months, the stock was up a lot. It got up to about 115. Then the Great Recession hit and it really came down. It looks like about $15 at its low. That was its lowest point ever. Then it did run up a lot the next two years, traded sideways up through 2015. Came down a lot in 2015, below $50. Then a massive run-up to over $200. That was in the beginning of 2019. That was its highest point ever. In March 2020, it got down to about 105. Then ran up to about 165, 170. It did fall below $100 in mid-2022. But it's been trading over $100 in 2023 about 40% lower than its all-time high. There are 144 companies in the same industry as VMware, and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They spend more than the median and average in CapEx. They have a really bad debt to equity ratio. For every dollar of equity, they have $6 of debt. But as we saw earlier, they do have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. So they could pay off a lot of the debt if they needed to. They generate lots of free cash flow, 4.6 billion higher than Palo Alto and Synopsys, and those two companies have a higher market cap. They rank sixth in market cap. Microsoft is number one by far, then Oracle, then Adobe, Synopsys, and Palo Alto. 
Their price to book is pretty weak. That stock price of a book value per share, 30.4. Their PE is average, worse than the median. That stock price over earnings per share. The most important thing is having cash and their price to free cash flow is really good. Better than the median and average. A lot better than the top five companies. Also better than Ford and Net & Square. This means investors are paying $12 for $1 free cash flow. Their price of sales is between the median and average. They generate lots of revenue, but their five-year annual revenue growth rate is only 10%, which is lower than the median and average. It is higher than Oracle. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 23% discount. They've been around 25 years. They're a pretty well-respected company. The fact that Broadcom, a really successful semiconductor company, wants to acquire them is a great sign. I ranked their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 4 to 10. So let me know what you think. Give the video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.